Well, hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you for joining me today as we study 2 Kings chapters 2 through 7. What an amazing week we've got today. So many great stories this week. And my goal with this channel is to help you to either teach or study the scriptures with more relevancy, uh, with more impact, with more power. And I pray that uh, something that I share with you today can help you uh, as a teacher or as a student of the scriptures. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. For an icebreaker this week, I'd like to do the following little quiz with you. Can you match the question with the answer? Now you can see that I've got uh, various numbers listed there on the right-hand side. And all you have to do is choose the number that matches the question. How many pounds in a ton? 2,000. How many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. How many piano keys on a standard piano? The answer is 88. How many cards are in a deck with the jokers? 54. How many trombones led the big parade in The Music Man? 76 trombones led the big parade. And then finally, what's the elevation of Mount Everest in feet? 29,032. Well, with that as an introduction, in my personal study of 2 Kings this past week, I saw an interesting pattern. Almost every story in this week's block contains a compelling or thought-provoking question. And I'm going to provide you with a list of those questions on the following handout. And your task is to identify the answers that match the question. And you'll see that on the handout, I've selected 10 different stories from these chapters to draw your attention to. Now, I know that's a lot. Uh, you may wonder how we're going to cover 10 different stories in our usual about an hour long time frame. Well, we're not going to go verse by verse. And I'm going to assume that you have read these scripture stories already as we discuss them. And I might summarize them a little bit, but for the most part, we're going to just jump right into the discussion of the principles and the truths that they teach. So I'd invite you to go and read 2 Kings chapters 2 through 7 first, and then come back and watch the video. Also, as you can imagine, we won't be doing the full treatment on each of these stories either. Uh, I'm going to give you a few things to work with, um, some insight into the story, a truth that it teaches, and a like in the scriptures discussion question or activity. And as a teacher, you could either approach the lesson with the handout, or you could just try to cover as many as you can, or, or choose the stories that you feel your students will be most interested in. So here we go. Truth number one from 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 7 through 15. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Is the question. How many of you out there would describe yourselves as visual learners? Can you relate to that? Well, I know that I can. Object lessons, illustrations, symbolism, demonstrations, pictures. These things have, have a power to teach and edify in a way that no lecture or speech really can. And apparently, God tends to be a bit of a visual teacher. Or he understands this aspect of human nature because he really employs these techniques quite frequently in the scriptures. Some lessons really don't need a lot of explanation or commentary. 2 Kings chapter 2 here contains just such a story. And I want you to read it and just tell me what you feel the Lord was communicating visually to those who witnessed it and to all of us who are reading it right now. And what do you feel? The message is. And what happens is that as Elijah walks towards the mountain, he takes off his mantle or his robe. He hits the Jordan River with it and it parts. And then later, he's taken up into heaven by a chariot of fire. And, and as that happens, that same mantle falls to the ground. Now, Elisha is with him. And what does Elisha do? He walks over, picks it up, wraps himself in the mantle, 
And then he goes out and he performs the exact same miracle at the Jordan River that Elijah has just performed. So visually, what, what, what does that represent? What does the mantle represent, first of all? It represents authority, priesthood, the calling of prophet. And the message? When one of God's servants is taken or their calling has been fulfilled, even though the servant is gone, the power, the authority, or the responsibility still remains here on the earth. And it's the mantle that holds the power, not necessarily the individual. Therefore, the answer to our question, where is the Lord God of Elijah? Well, it's what the people conclude after witnessing the miracle. The spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. God knows that the authority and responsibility to lead and bless his people needs to continue on the earth or in his church, even though his servants are released. The mantle remains. And that applies to all callings and responsibilities. There's a mantle that rests on missionaries. There's a mantle that rests on prophets. There's a mantle that rests on teachers. A mantle that rests on Relief Society presidents and bishops and primary teachers and every other calling in the church that depends on the authority and power of God to fulfill it. And that's one of the reasons we can have confidence in ourselves to perform whatever God calls us to do. Because the mantle brings powers and abilities with it. Elisha didn't have the power to part the Jordan River until he had received the mantle. And then he could. I think it's quite a natural thing for us to doubt our abilities when we're called to fulfill a responsibility in the church. And if, if we don't feel like we have the ability to do a, a certain calling or fulfill a, a specific responsibility, you know, we're probably right. We probably can't do it on our own. But don't for a second doubt the power of the mantle. The mantle comes from God. And wearing it will allow us to do what he desires us to do. It gives us the power. I know that I felt that mantle on my shoulders on many occasions in various callings. I felt it as a missionary. I felt it as a teacher. I felt it particularly strongly when I was called as a bishop. There are certain weaker aspects of my character that I feel have been strengthened by the mantle of the calling. I've sensed some changes in my personality and my ability and my approach to certain things because of it. The mantle gives the power. And then an interesting observation here. Take some of the modern prophets. Have you ever noticed when a new prophet is called that there is somewhat of a change in them? Maybe it's just me, but could that be because the mantle of prophet or, or president of the church has rested on them? Every prophet has their own personality and gifts and strengths. No doubt about that. But have you ever noticed a change in one of the brethren from apostle to president? If I had to describe Ezra Taft Benson as an apostle, I would perhaps say that he was a little, and I want to be careful about the word that I use here, tougher, harder, a little more rigid in his teaching. But when he became the prophet, when he became the president of the church, you can almost sense a little bit of a softening in him. Could that have been because of the mantle he was called to wear? On the other hand, what about Thomas S. Monson? I would say his style as an apostle was a bit more lighthearted and maybe just a bit more relaxed as a part of his personality. But when he became the president of the church, to me, it appeared that there was a bit of a firming in his character, a greater purposefulness in his style. Could that have been the effect of the mantle on his shoulders? Something else to consider. Prophets will often wrap themselves in the mantle of those who come before them. For example, when Elisha parts the Jordan, he's obviously wrapping himself in the mantle of Elijah. But whose mantle was Elijah wrapping himself in when he performs that miracle? Joshua. 
Joshua did the same thing when he led the children of Israel into the promised land. And whose mantle was Joshua wrapping himself in when he did that? The mantle of Moses, who had parted the Red Sea. And then Jesus, does he wrap himself in the same mantle as each of these prophets? I think so. But Jesus always seems to take it one step further. He performs a miracle that's just a little bit greater. Instead of parting a body of water that stands in front of him as a barrier and walking across it on dry ground, what does Jesus do? No, he just walks on top of the water. When Jesus does that, I feel that he was wrapping himself in the mantle of Elisha and Elijah and Joshua and Moses. Many of the miracles of Jesus can be compared and connected to miracles that prophets performed in the Old Testament. Now, why did he do this? To help the people to know that he was the Christ, that he was the one that the prophets had prophesied of, and that he held their same power. The Jews should have recognized the Savior when he came, because he mirrored and in many ways transcended their miracles. That's one of the purposes of the mantle as well. It helps others to know that the new individual has now been called to fulfill the same role. This happened with Brigham Young after Joseph Smith had been martyred, and many of the members of the church were confused as to who would assume the role of president of the church now. Many witnesses say that as Brigham spoke in a special meeting, that he either appeared or sounded exactly like Joseph in that moment. And in that case, the servant was gone, but the mantle remained. It was passed to Brigham Young. And I believe that that same mantle now rests on Russell M. Nelson. So the truth, when a servant of God departs, and that could be either through release or passing away, the mantle of God's authority remains. To liken the scriptures, here's a short activity that you could do with your students to help them to apply the story. Encourage them to choose one of the following scenarios and either have them write or share with the class what they think they would say to these individuals in these situations. And encourage them to use the story in 2 Kings chapter 2 somewhere in their answer. So scenario number one, the president of the church has just passed away. I had such a strong testimony of him as a prophet, and now I'm struggling to accept the new president and the decisions and counsels he's giving. He's so different from the prophet I've known. What should I do? Or scenario number two, my youth leader just got released. I can't believe the bishop would do that to us. I had such a great relationship with them, and they were so cool. I don't even know this new person and don't see how things could ever be the same. What should I do? All right, moving on to truth number two, 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. And all right, I did cheat a little on this one because it's the only story of the 10 that isn't based on an actual question in the scriptures. But it is a story that definitely raises a lot of questions in people when they read it. And so the question is just three question marks and an exclamation point. It's just one of those what kind of stories in the Old Testament? You know what I'm talking about here? And if you read that, you'll know what I'm talking about. It, it is a bit of a shocker. And I love telling this story to my students and just waiting for their reaction and having them look up at me with, with wide eyes and saying, wait, 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 so the bears ate them because they made fun of his baldness? Well, well maybe. Uh, a little bit of help here. When it says little children, be sure to look at the footnote. These aren't toddlers. Right? They're not nine or ten-year-olds. The original Hebrew word suggests youths, uh, teenagers, maybe even 20-year-olds. I, I don't know. It's probably a group of punk teenagers giving the prophet a hard time. Now, I know that that's not much better, but maybe helps a little bit. They're, they're making fun of the prophet. And then bears come out of the woods, and the scriptures say that they tear them. Now, honestly, that probably means that they were killed by the bears. But it could also possibly be interpreted that 
they were just scattered by the bears, you know, tearing through the crowd and frightening them away. I don't know that for sure, but it's a possibility. But are there any principles that you could see are taught by this story? A few ideas. For one, don't mock the prophets. Right? When we mock our inspired leaders or dismiss them, regard them as obsolete or old, don't be surprised when the bears of unbelief, consequence, bondage, or worldliness tear through our lives or bring spiritual death in their jaws. Another idea. What were the youths doing with their words? They were tearing Elijah down, making fun of his outward appearance, belittling him and his authority. Maybe the lesson could be, when I seek to tear others down, I will be torn. What what is it? What do we lose when we tear other people down? Potential friendships are torn. The respect of those around us who may, may begin to wonder if we'll talk about them in the same way will be torn. The spirit is torn from us. Unity and brotherhood is torn. Instead, we should do as Doctrine and Covenants 108 verse 7 counsels. Therefore, strengthen your brethren in all your conversations, in all your prayers, in all your exhortations, and in all your doings. Personally, I'd rather be the mocked than the mocker. I'd rather be the persecuted than the persecutor. Those that seek to put others down usually only reveal their own insecurities and only succeed in isolating themselves and losing the spirit. Her match then for the story would be don't tear others down. To liken the scriptures, in the spirit of living the lesson of this story, let's do the opposite from these youths. Rather than tearing people down, Let's seek to build people up right now. Two options here. What's something you love about the prophet or the brethren or another church leader that you know? Give them a compliment or share some words of affirmation and belief in them. Or do the same with someone that's right here in the classroom with us. Share something good and sincere about somebody in our class. And as a teacher, I found this to be one of the most unifying and positive discussions that we ever have as a class. Truth number three, 2 Kings 4, verses 1 through 7. The question, what hast thou in the house? Now, I hinted that we would discuss this truth last week when we studied the story of the widow of Zarephath. And in this chapter, we have another widow with great faith who had the courage to put God first. She's also a great example of the fourth watch principle. But there's something additional here that I wish to point out. What did Elisha require of her before the miracle was performed? Before the multiplying of the oil in the vessels that she provides? Elisha didn't just come and wave his hand and make the money that she needed to free her sons from the debt appear in front of her. He asked this question first. What hast thou in the house? And she brings what she has, one small pot of oil. That was it. But that was still something. She wasn't empty-handed. So Elisha answers and says, bring it to me. And that would be the match for our question. And then he instructs her to go out and borrow as many other vessels that she could find, which she does, and the miracle occurs. Now, this is a crucial pattern in how the Lord works miracles for his disciples. He always seems to ask for what we have first. God doesn't intend to do everything for us. Remember, he's training us. He's teaching us. He's preparing us here in mortality for greater things in eternity. We're like little gods in training. So he invites us and and he says, bring me what you have. And have the faith to put it into my hands and then see what I can do with it. How I can multiply it and make it more than enough for what you need. 
the same with the widow of Zarephath. Elijah asked her for what she had first. She had a little cake. She had a little oil. And with that, Elijah was able to multiply it and make it more than enough to get through the famine. Speaking of wrapping yourself in the mantle of those that came before, what was Jesus' manifestation of this miracle? Did he ever do something where he multiplied something in order to feed somebody? The feeding of the 5,000. The same pattern is demonstrated there. Before he performed that miracle, he he didn't make food materialize out of nothing. He said, what do you have? And the apostles say, oh, uh, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus says, bring them to me and put them into my hands. And they do. And he blesses it and makes it enough. More than enough. Enough to fill them and still have 12 baskets left over. How does that apply to us? Whatever miracle you request or help that you desire or answer to a prayer that you seek, be sure to bring what you have first. Bring your faith, no matter how small. Bring your ability, no matter how insignificant it seems. Bring your sacrifice, even though it may seem like nothing in comparison to what you need. But it's amazing what God can do with that small offering. He can feed thousands with it. He can get you through the famine. He can match the need and exceed. So the truth, when I lack sufficient for my needs, if I bring what I have, place it in God's hands, he can multiply it. To liken the scriptures, has God ever multiplied your oil in some way? And please share. And I can think of many times when he's done this for me. He's multiplied my finances when I've paid my tithes and offerings. He's multiplied my ability as I've shown a willingness to serve in various callings. He's multiplied my time and my energy when I've been willing to put spiritual things first. He's multiplied my patience as a parent, when I've been willing to give love to my family members, and on and on. God can multiply our oil when we have the faith to bring to him what we have first. Truth number four, 2 Kings 4, 8 through 17. What then is to be done for her? The Shunammite woman. And don't you just love her? Don't you just love her heart? The scriptures describe her as a great woman. What is it that made her so great? Did she accomplish some tremendous task? Did she lead armies into battle? Did she perform some miracle? No. What is it that made her great? Her desire to serve. Her kindness. Without being asked, she graciously saw to the needs and comfort of Elisha. She sensed that Elisha could use a place to stay whenever he passed through that area. And so she makes a comfortable little room for him. Uh, It had a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. How thoughtful of her. She renders this service with no thought of reward. So Elisha says, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. And Elisha asks our question, What shall be done for her? And she's blessed. She doesn't have any children, so Elisha promises that she will have a son. And that's our match. She shall have a child. But keep in mind that that's not why she performed the service. She wasn't motivated by a desire to get anything from this interaction. She's not in the back of her mind thinking, Oh, if I, if I do this for the prophet, maybe he'll put in a good word to God for me, and I can receive this blessing that I've been hoping for. Maybe he'll promise me a son. And that's not it at all. She served and thought of her fellow man just because that's the kind of woman that she was. And she's blessed because of it. Although I believe that she still would have done this kind of thing, even if she knew that there would be no future reward for it. Though she asked for nothing, the Lord, through his prophet, chose a suitable blessing for her. It's often the best way. 
I've sometimes received my desires from the Lord only to discover that they didn't bring the fulfillment that I had anticipated. Other times I've been denied what I wanted only to discover that the Lord had chosen a better path for me. Like the Shunammite woman, hopefully we can serve for the joy of serving, allowing the Lord to choose the blessings that will result in our greatest happiness. These acts of service and kindness are their own reward. So the truth here, when we serve with no thought of reward, God's rewards will still follow. To liken the scriptures, who is someone you know who has served with no thought for a reward? Truth number five, 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. Ah, the story of Naaman, the Syrian captain. Such a powerful one and a personal favorite. There are two great questions asked in this story that I'd like to focus on. Now, hopefully you've read it and you know what happens. Uh, Naaman is the captain of the Syrian armies and a man of great wealth and influence. But he's a leper. And we learn that Naaman, in his military campaigns, had captured a little Israelite maid who was now one of his servants. And perhaps there's a quick additional principle that I might throw in here from the story that, that she teaches us, this fantastic little girl. Here is Naaman, her captor, and she sees him suffering from leprosy. And she offers up her advice in testimony. Perhaps this suggests that he'd been a good master to her. She says, oh, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria with an exclamation point there, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And she must have said it with such sincerity, with such conviction, that he believes her, and he acts on her simple declaration of faith. This little girl, maybe the message there, never underestimate the power of your testimony and faith. Declare it. Proclaim it boldly. Even the testimony of a child has the power to change lives. So bear it. And to think, if it hadn't been for her example, her boldness, her faith, Naaman probably would have died a leper. So Naaman goes to Elisha with a dazzling display of his influence. He brings his chariot and his horses and silver and gold and changes of clothing. And he rides up with this cohort to the prophet's house. And how is he received? Elisha doesn't even come out. He just sends a servant to tell him to go and wash in the Jordan River seven times. And that's not what he was expecting. Here he is, this great man with great wealth and great power and great expectations of how he thought this miracle was to take place. In my mind, I picture him thinking that a, uh, a Beauty and the Beast type transformation was going to take place. You know, this, this dramatic light show floating in the air with light radiating around him as he miraculously is transformed and, and made whole once again. Naaman even describes his expectation. Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. You know, uh, be healed, Naaman. And, oh, oh, oh. He, he wanted this big dramatic moment. But no, instead, a servant comes out and says, go dip yourself in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be clean. That's it. Anticlimactic is an understatement. And Naaman takes his questioning a step further. He says, all right, if I have to go bathe in a river, why the Jordan? I can think of lots of other better rivers to bathe in. And that leads to our question. He says, are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters in Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. You see, the Jordan River is not the nicest river in the world, so to speak. I've been there. I've seen it. It's kind of muddy, small, and unremarkable. 
there are certainly prettier places on the planet. So it shouldn't surprise us that Naaman questions the request. He's demonstrating a common phenomena when it comes to the Lord or the prophet's commands. Sometimes we want to bathe in a different river. The rivers we're asked to bathe in don't always look that inviting to us. We may struggle with certain counsels or teachings of the brethren. So maybe we hope to ignore the instruction, modify it, to, to a counsel that we're, we're more comfortable with, a counsel that's easier, more glamorous, more to our taste. But the correct answer to Naaman's question might be, no, Naaman, you may not bathe in those other rivers and expect the same blessing. You've got to bathe in the right river. Only the Jordan will do. If Naaman had decided to go back to Damascus and dip himself seven times in the Abana River, would he have gotten the same result? Would he have been healed? I don't think so. We can't expect the same blessings when we alter the instructions. Sometimes we accept the Lord's way as best for most people, but think that we're the exception. And there are, it's true, exceptions to almost every principle of the gospel. But they're much rarer than I think we'd like to believe. If we feel that we're the exception to the Lord's commands, if we asked him for counsel and didn't hear what we wanted, then hopefully we'll humbly turn towards the Jordan instead of longingly looking over our shoulder at the Abana. When I had my first son, I remember my father telling me, a question that he asked his mother, my grandmother, when he had his first child, my older sister. Because my grandmother had been successful in raising three children in the gospel, my dad wondered what parenting advice she had to, to help him to do the same. You know, what are the secrets? What are the hacks? Her response? Well, she said, your mother was too stupid to think that she had a better plan than the one the Lord gave. So I just did everything the church asks us to do. I can see my grandma saying that. So I'm sure you could probably guess what my dad's childhood was like. Church on Sunday, seminary, family prayer and scripture study, an expectation to live the standards in the, for the strength of youth, young men's and young women's activities each week, Sometimes members may feel like they have a better plan than the Lord's, and so they adjust the commandment to their liking. The prophet's counsel doesn't match my political views, so I guess I'll just ignore them. The prophet's counsel doesn't fit with my business or personal financial strategy. I'll do my own thing. The prophet's counsel is interfering with my social life a bit. I can fudge a bit on the word of wisdom or my media choices or my language, just a bit, so I can fit in. I'd rather bathe in the Abana or the Farpar than in the Jordan. And the Jordan's just too muddy for my liking. When we do this, brothers and sisters, we shouldn't be surprised when the promised blessings for obedience don't appear. Blessings are lost when we bathe in the wrong river. The truth, bathe in the right river and be healed. When we seek to modify, ignore, or adjust the Lord's counsels, we will most likely miss out on the promised blessings. And to liken the scriptures, can you think of an area where you may be bathing in the wrong river? And are you willing to change that? Truth number six. Same story. The question here, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? This is the rhetorical question that one of Naaman's servants asks him. It's a great, it's a great question. Uh, he's a great minor character, that little servant of Naaman's. Naaman feels that the request does not match the magnitude of the promise. Ah, how could this simple thing work? It's so small. It's trivial. Dip yourself in a muddy river seven times? That's not a big enough deal. Naaman desired to be asked to do something more grand, more showy, more important. 
maybe to match the ego that he had or uh, the status of his character that he feels he has. And I sometimes have to ask myself why the instruction was to dip himself seven times. Why seven? Well, picture that moment. How do you think that would have been with Naaman? I picture him dipping down in the water the first time and then popping up out of the water. And what would you do? I think he probably excitedly looked down at his arms and body to see if it was working. I mean, has has anything happened? And I don't think he would have seen a thing after the first dip. I believe that the transformation only took place after he had performed all seven completely. And what do you think would have happened if Naaman had given up after the fourth or the fifth or the sixth dip? What if he had frustratedly left the river thinking, this isn't working, this is ridiculous? And remember, he's not that wild about the idea in the first place. Well, I believe that Naaman would have died a leper. All seven dips were required for the miracle to take place. So the match for our question here, it's what Naaman will essentially say in in response to that question. Yes, if the prophet had asked me to do some great thing, I would have done it. Therefore, I will humble myself and wash seven times. I'll do the easier thing. He's not asking me to do some great and important or big or difficult thing. I would have done the difficult thing. So it just makes sense that I would be willing to do the easier thing. And what can that story teach us? Are there simple things that God has asked us to do repeatedly? Yeah. Are they sometimes easy to dismiss as being too simple to be worthwhile or to work? Do we make Naaman's mistake of thinking that it's only the big or grandiose things that bring the blessings? Are we more than willing to fulfill the big callings, the ones we deem to be important, but we balk at the seemingly smaller callings that aren't as showy or we don't attach as much importance to? Do we say that we would be willing to die for our testimony, but we won't live for it by keeping the small and simple things? Are there commandments that we keep that don't reveal their blessings immediately, but only after repeated and consistent obedience? Do we keep going even when we don't see the blessings yet? I think that's the key to understanding the story of Naaman. Which dip do you think healed him? I don't believe it was the first dip or the fourth or even the seventh dip that healed Naaman. I believe it was the combination of all the dips together that made the difference. The seventh dip didn't heal him any more than the second or the fifth did. It's the accumulation of repeated simple acts of obedience that bring the promised blessings. How many times do we say our prayers before a relationship with deity is formed? How many times do I say, I love you, before my marriage becomes strong and unbreakable? How many times do I pay my tithing before the principle of sacrifice really sinks deep into my heart? How many times do I study my scriptures before a foundation of gospel knowledge is forged? How many times do I hold family prayers or have family scripture study before my children gain an abiding testimony of the gospel? The key is that we perform all seven dips without giving up. That's what matters most. We don't want to become six-dip saints, right? Go all the way. If you don't see the desired or promised blessings yet, continue to obey the counsel, and eventually the blessing will come. You'll look back and see the healing. Maybe you don't see it every time you say your personal prayers, or every time you go to church, or every time you pay your tithing. But the miracles will come eventually. Oftentimes, in hindsight, you'll look back and you'll see, wow, I was being blessed all along. The miracle really did occur. Don't lose hope. Don't give in. Persevere until the seventh washing, when all the promises of the Lord are fulfilled. 
Put your trust in the Lord and endure to the end. Keep right on dipping until you see the Lord's hand in your life. Trust the prophet. Trust the scriptures. Trust your heavenly Father. Our truth, then, it's the accumulation of small, repeated acts of obedience that bring the greatest blessings. To liken the scriptures, are there any small and simple commandments that you've been neglecting? Or, or what great blessings or miracles have you experienced by keeping the small and simple commandments? Truth number seven, 2 Kings 5, verses 15 through 16 and 20 through 27. Is it a time to receive money? Gehazi, Elisha's servant, here's an interesting case study in dishonesty. Did, did you catch what happened in the story? Once Naaman is healed, he's so grateful that he offers to give Elisha great wealth as a token of his appreciation. But Elisha doesn't perform miracles for money, but out of a charity and a love for his fellow man. And so he refuses to take it. And Naaman graciously rides away. But Gehazi, hearing about the promise of riches, thinks to himself, hmm, well, if Elisha isn't going to take anything, why not cash in on this miracle myself? And so he runs after Naaman, stops the procession, and says, uh, Naaman, actually, Elisha changed his mind. He uh, had some visitors that just arrived, and he could use a little money to, to help them. Yeah, that's it, to help them. So he lies to Naaman, who gives him two talents of silver and some clothing. And Gehazi is chuckling all the way home at his good fortune. But when he comes to Elisha again, he's questioned. Gehazi, whence comest thou? Or where have you been? And as it is so often with dishonesty, to cover up his first lie, he's got to tell another, digging himself even deeper into a hole of deceit. Thy servant went no whither. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about, Elisha. I haven't been gone. I've been here the whole time. Well, then the prophet asks him our question. Gehazi, is it a time to receive money? and to receive garments, and olive yards, and vineyards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants? You know, what, what's he asking him here? Gehazi, is this a situation or circumstance that justifies the taking of money? Is wealth more valuable to you than your integrity? And maybe there are times when we, we need to ask ourselves the same questions. Is this a time to prioritize money, or personal gain. As a parent, when we're trying to determine how much time to spend making money and how much time we choose to spend with our families, we maybe should ask this question. Is this a time to receive money? When it comes to our tithes and offerings, do we hold back so as to increase our prosperity? When it comes to our business dealings, are we honest with our fellow man? or our employers? Do we value integrity over wealth? The match for our question here? No, our integrity is worth more. So the truth, my integrity is more valuable than my prosperity. And to liken the scriptures, to help my students really consider their own level of integrity, I sometimes like to give them the following honesty quiz. Now, this should be done anonymously and doesn't need to be handed in. It's just a personal exercise that places them in various scenarios where their integrity may be tested and gives them some options to choose from on how they feel they would react. And here's an example of just one of the questions. You're taking a stroll when you see a stray $20 bill fall from the pocket of an elderly woman walking in front of you. She doesn't notice the fallen money. What do you do? A, pick up the money and hand it back to her. B, pick up the money, hand her a five, and tell her she dropped it. Fifteen dollars is a reasonable finder's fee. Or C, pick up the money and pocket it. Finder's keepers. Now, I won't take the time to go through all the questions here, 
but I invite you to take a look at it if you're interested in maybe using it. And I'll make it available for download to anyone who may like to use that. All right, truth number eight. 2 Kings 6, verses 1 through 7. Where fell it? Is the question. This is a fun little story. A man is out chopping wood when he loses his axe head in the river. So he goes to Elisha and he says, Ah, uh, this axe head, it was borrowed. It's not even mine. What shall I do? When you stop to think about this, is this a matter of life and death? In the grand scheme of things, is this really an emergency that that demands the prophet's power? Probably not. It's a small issue to us. But to that man, in that moment, that's all that mattered. This was a big deal for him. It wasn't even his axe that he was using. That would have made for a very uncomfortable conversation with whoever he borrowed it from. And so what does Elisha do? He puts a stick into the water, and the scriptures tell us that the iron swims to it. The axe head is recovered, and all is well. Now, after we just read the story of Naaman, where a man's life was at stake, really makes this story stand out even more. It's the juxtaposition that sends the message. And what do you think that message might be? The way that I see it? God can do big miracles and small miracles. He answers big prayers and little prayers. He can help us in major significant ways and also in minor inconsequential ways. There's no prayer too big or too little for God. Now, that doesn't always mean that he he always performs the big or small miracles. But he can. And oftentimes he does. So even if your request seems insignificant, go ahead and ask him. He'll hear you. If it's important to you, it will be important to him. He'll hear it, and he'll consider your request in terms of his grace and his wisdom. So the match to the question, where fell it, would be, it shall be recovered. And it was. So our truth God can answer small prayers too, just as much as he can answer large prayers. And to liken the scriptures, has God ever answered one of your small prayers? And what happened? Truth number nine, 2 Kings 6, 8 through 18. Alas, my master, how shall we do? In this next story, Elisha and his servant are surrounded by the hosts of the Syrian army while staying in the city of Dothan. And the servant, beside himself, implores Elisha, Alas, my master, how shall we do? Oh my gosh, we're we're dead men. We're outnumbered. But Elisha shows no concern. He's not worried. And I'm sure this leaves the servant a bit incredulous. How can you be so calm at a time like this, Elisha? The prophet gives him his encouraging response. A great response for all of us to consider when we ask, Oh no, uh, how shall we do in despair? He says, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. Now perhaps the servant looked around at that and thought, Where are you getting this reassurance? You're wrong, Elisha. They that be with them are more than they that be with us. Just look around you. Well, at that, Elisha prays that the Lord will open his servant's eyes. And he does. And what does the servant see? Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. It's a beautiful story. Can you relate? Have you ever felt outnumbered? Have you ever felt like the enemy had the upper hand in your life? Have you ever felt intimidated by the forces that surround you? Perhaps this story can help. Realize that there are unseen forces and powers out there. Angels, the Spirit, God, Jesus Christ, your ancestors. And they're out there ready to race to your aid. 
we have allies in heaven and help from places that we may not even realize or see with our natural eyes. In an address that he gave at BYU, Jeffrey R. Holland once referred to this Old Testament story and said the following, In the gospel of Jesus Christ, you have help from both sides of the veil, and you must never forget that. When disappointment and discouragement strike, and they will, you remember and never forget that if our eyes could be opened, we would see horses and chariots of fire as far as the eye can see, riding at reckless speed to come to our protection. They will always be there, these armies of heaven, in defense of Abraham's seed. I believe that we can rely on these forces when we feel weak or overwhelmed by the problems that surround us. They that be with us are more than they that be with them. The truth, when we feel outnumbered or overwhelmed, if we put our faith in God, He can send unseen relief and support to help us in times of trouble. And to liken the scriptures, what evidence have you seen in your own life that this principle is true? Have you ever experienced the help of the chariots of fire? Truth number 10, 2 Kings 6, 19 through 23. The question, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? Now, this is a continuation of the previous story. How do those chariots of fire manifest their help and power in this situation? Well, Elisha has the power to smite the Syrian army with blindness, with the power of God. And now the tables have turned and Elisha comes out to them and he says, follow me. I know the way to where you need to go. Listen to the sound of my voice. And they follow him. And where does he lead them? Straight into the middle of Samaria, right into the center of enemy territory. Now they are the ones that are surrounded. They're getting a little taste of their own medicine. Now here comes our question. It comes from the king of Israel, who now sees that his enemies are in his hands. He's got the advantage now. And he asks, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? The fact that the request is repeated suggests eagerness or a desire. You know, let me at him. Let me at him. I've been waiting for an opportunity like this. Time to get my revenge on the Syrians. But what does Elisha have them do? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldst thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them, that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So don't attack them, king of Israel. Feed them and let them go home, safe and sound. And so the king does. And that would be our match on the handout. No, feed them instead. And what's the result of this? The final phrase of verse 23 kind of says it all, doesn't it? So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. What apparently is one of the best ways to get rid of your enemies? Make them your friends. When given an opportunity to hurt or to get revenge or to take advantage, don't. Serve others. Help them. Feed them. The benefits of kindness and charity far outweigh any smug conceit that stems from spite or reprisal. There's a fantastic story about Joseph Smith where he'd been kidnapped by his enemies who were planning on taking him back to Missouri for prosecution, probably with the ultimate intent to kill him. But to the kidnapper's dismay, they take a wrong turn on the way back to Missouri and instead take the road that leads them straight to Nauvoo, where Joseph is promptly rescued. Now they were in his hands. And what did Joseph do? He had Emma cook them a sumptuous meal and sent them on their way. He invites them to dinner. You may also recall Jesus teaching this principle in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, But I say unto you, love your enemies. 
Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. It's Matthew 5, 44. So our truth here, the best way to get rid of your enemies is to make them your friends. Kindness is stronger and more effective than revenge. To liken the scriptures, do you have any Syrian armies in your own life right now at this time? People that you'd like to get back at, even the score with, exact your revenge on? How could you feed them instead? And will you? Now, aren't those great stories? Such a fun block of scripture. I hope you learned something new. Perhaps one of the questions that we study today has mirrored one of your own questions. And that's the power of the scriptures. They hold the key to so many of life's questions. We've just got to do a little searching in order to find them. Now, before we conclude, there's a big picture kind of question that I'd like to leave you with. As I studied these stories this week, a larger question seemed to keep looming at the back of my mind. And it goes something like this. Why does God intervene in some cases and not others? I mean, is there any rhyme or reason to, to why God does what he does? The gravity of the stories is so varied here in 2 Kings. Why smite a Gehazi, the teenagers with the she-bears, or even an Uzzah, you know, who, who touched the ark for seemingly small infractions and not take others whose evil has certainly affected and brought more suffering to thousands? Why smite them and not smite a Hitler or a Stalin or a child abuser? Also, why does God intervene in blessing some people but not others? I'm sure that the woman in debt with the two sons was not the only person in Israel with great challenges on their hands, or the Shunammite woman, the only Israelite with an unfulfilled desire, or Naaman, the only leper in the kingdom. Naaman wasn't even an Israelite, or the man with the axe head. Surely that wasn't a matter of life and death. Why answer his request and deny others with much greater issues? Why not bless them with God's help? And that pattern, that same kind of pattern exists today, doesn't it? You may have asked the question yourself at some point as, as you look at the world around you. Maybe you hear someone get up and bear their testimony and share how God has blessed them in some way or answered their prayers or fulfilled their desires. But then you think, I mean, why did God answer their prayer? But my prayer is going unanswered. My issue is even bigger than theirs. Your desire seems like a greater one, a more important one, one with higher consequences. Why has God answered their prayers, but not yours? And why does God intervene in, in protecting some people from evil, but not others? And what's the answer to that question? I don't know. <laughs> I wish I could give you the definitive reason. These issues are difficult to ascertain, and nobody can really speak with the wisdom of God. But that may be a very good discussion question to ask your class. In fact, I'm very curious to hear how, how faithful members of the church would answer that question. If you've got a good response, put it in the comments below. I'd like to read it. And I'm sure there will be members of your classes that can come up with better answers than the one that I can give. But let me offer a quick thought. Perhaps the only answer I could give is the one that Isaiah gives in Isaiah 55, 8 through 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I guess what it comes down to is, drum roll please, faith in God. Trust in God. One of the greatest challenges that we'll have in this life is to learn to trust in God's wisdom. We don't have the power to see things with his perspective. We don't have his vantage point. I imagine that God could look down and say, hey, you know what? You have no idea how many times I have intervened and you just didn't realize it. 
because my intervention prevented things that would have happened. But they didn't. So so how would you know or see that? Because those things didn't happen. All you see are the things that did. I mean, how many Hitlers or, or Stalins has God removed before they could do their damage? And we just don't know about it. How many times has God protected you from evil or given you a blessing and you just assumed it was the normal course of your life? Have you ever prayed to arrive safely at some destination and lo and behold, you did? Maybe because of your prayer that happened. Maybe something was prevented because you had the faith to ask for God's help. Maybe God did intervene on our behalf, but how would we know? Maybe someday we will. And God isn't interested in getting the credit. But I wonder if he ever looks down at us when we doubt or question his wisdom or his plan or what he does or doesn't do and who he answers and who he doesn't and where he intervenes and where he doesn't intervene. And maybe he just shakes his head a little and he says lovingly and understandingly, my child, you just don't understand. If you could only see what I could see. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. Trust me, all will be crystal clear someday. Your mortal eyes cannot behold and your mortal minds cannot comprehend at this time. So I don't have the answer to why God intervenes in some cases and not others. But I have faith that someday all my questions will be answered. I believe that there is an explanation to every question and every problem and every life situation that we encounter. Big or small, general or personal, right down to the issues and unanswered prayers of my own personal life. I don't know all the answers, but I have faith that there are answers and that those answers will come and that I will be satisfied with those answers. The big questions of my life the big doubts, the big concerns, the why didn't you intervene, the why did you answer their prayers and not mine, and how could you allow that to happen to them? They will all be beautifully and satisfactorily answered and will say, oh, well, that makes sense, God. I'm content with your explanation." And that's our lesson for this week. I hope that there's something that I've shared today that can help you. And if you feel like this video or this lesson has helped you in any way, share it with somebody else who you feel it could benefit. If you're interested in the resources that I make to help teachers teach, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to each of those resources. Thank you so much for watching and spending this time with me. Now get out there and teach with power.